Okay, good morning everybody and uh, welcome to the April Borough Service Cabinet meeting. We're going to start by taking the roll. Community Board 1? Present. Community Board 2? Community Board 3? Here. Community Board 4? Community Board 5? Here. Community Board 6? Here. Community Board 7? Here. Community Board 8? Community Board 9? Here. Community Board 10? Here. <coughs> Community Board 11? Here. Community Board 12? Here. Community Board 13? Community Board 14? Here. Community Board 15? Here. Nope. Community Board 16? Here. <laughs> Community Board 17? Here. Community Board 18? Go to the agencies, ACS, yeah. Public Library, Commission on Human Rights, Con Edison, yeah. Department for the Aging, yeah. Department of Buildings, Department of City Planning, Department of Citywide Administrative Services, Department of Consumer Affairs, Department of Corrections, Department of Design and Construction, DEP, Department of Finance, Department of Health, Department of Homeless Services, HPD, Do It, Department of Parks and Recreation, Department of Probation, Department of Sanitation North, Department of Sanitation South, Department of Transportation, DYCD, Fire Department, HRA, Mayor's Office of Community Assistance, National Grid, Here. New York City Transit, Here. Office of Emergency Management, Here. Police Department North, Police Department South, Small Business Services, U.S. Postal Service, Verizon 311. Okay, um, before we continue with the rest of the meeting, uh, I want to just take a quick moment to recognize the loss of one of our colleagues, uh, Chaz Croder. I think believe Chaz was known to uh, many of us in this room, and I know that his passing is a shock to us all. Many of you have probably worked with him a lot longer than I've known him. I've only known him for about the last 15 months or so. And he was always a very warm and generous person. So if you all just please join me in a quick moment of silence to honor our colleague Chaz Croker. Thank you. Uh, I believe he's being waked today uh, from 2 o'clock to 7 o'clock at the Lawrence Woodward Funeral Home, 1 Troy Avenue. And his funeral is tomorrow morning, though I'm not sure the time. 10 o'clock? It's 10 o'clock? Okay. At the same location, and I don't know where the church is. But I think there was information that went passed around on email chains. Um, so we'll start with some quick announcements. Um, there were a bunch of flyers when you first walked in, as you all, you all grabbed them. April is, like last year, this month is Financial Empowerment, Financial Literacy Empowerment Month here at Borough Hall, where we do a series of events throughout the borough, working with different financial institutions to in increase financial literacy awareness throughout the borough. This year's theme is consumer debt. Brooklyn has double the nation's average of delinquent consumer debt. The national average is 4.5%. Brooklyn, I think, is 10.1%. And that's debt that is 90 days or, or um, older in delinquency. And the borough president has set a goal of lowering that by four percentage points over the next four years by doing a series of education workshops in the community, in the communities, I should say, uh, educating people on the hazards of bad debt, on the importance of paying debts on time, uh, pros and cons of credit cards, et cetera. So there are a series of flyers, the ones with the little piggy bank on them, with a number of the workshops that are coming up. There's a whole bunch of different dates through April and May. I'm not gonna read them all. You can see them on the flyers yourselves, but please spread that information around to your different constituencies, community board members, uh, and different community groups. So far, the response has been pretty uh, positive from the groups that we've done events with so far. And also on uh, next Thursday, April 23rd, we're doing a workshop here as part of Financial Literacy Empowerment Month called Women and Wealth, talking about women in the workplace and how they can help build up small businesses and build up capital. Uh, and that should be a good event as well. Uh, are there any other announcements from members of the service cabinet that would like to make at this time? Any district managers have any announcements they'd like to make? Like 
we, Ward 14, is hosting our uh, eighth annual youth conference on April 29th at Brooklyn College Subo Building. We have uh, almost 60 organizations and agencies participating. Some of you here are, thank you. And, uh, and last year we had nearly 700 young people between the ages of 12 and uh, 20. Um, and we um, are confident it will be a, another good uh, conference. So I hope you'll join us. And if there's any questions, please give me a call or check our website. Thank you. Any other district managers with an announcement to make? Do any agencies have any announcements they'd like to make at this time? We are. Yeah. I think we are. <laughs> Any other agency announcements? Any other agency announcements? Any announcements from members of the public who are present? Sure. Hi, good morning. I'm Alan Schulman, and we're in coordination with Eric Adams and the borough president's office. We're hosting a, a first ever service, community board service boot camp for youth 16 to 25 on May 16th, and I came to encourage all of you to help us participate in identifying young people in your neighborhoods and your communities who would, are organized um, and would be ready for this thing. The, the letter I distributed to you is the one that we've created that's going to go out to the principals and social studies coordinators and student government advisors and the appropriate teachers inside of all of the public high schools in Brooklyn encouraging them to identify students in their schools who would be ready for this kind of work. And the goal ultimately is um, where Youth on Board's campaign 118 is to uh, have two people appointed to each of the community boards. Um, but beyond that, what the educational piece for us is, we're starting to look at the social studies programs inside the high schools and looking at participation in the community and the committee work of the community boards as part of the social studies participation in government course. So please go back to your community boards, encourage the committee members who are connected to youth organizations in your neighborhoods and communities. We're not just looking for kids who are on their way to, to colleges. We're really looking for young people who represent the cross-section of our youth. Thank you. Thank you. And we actually, we already received a number of applications from 16 and 17 year olds for this year's community board um, appointments. And as they're being finalized the next week or so, uh, there'll probably be some appointments of, of uh, teenagers to the community board, which is a very exciting thing. So anyway, we can encourage more civic participation amongst the youth, teenagers, college students, et cetera. It's always a, it's always a, a plus. Uh, and the borough president's a strong supporter um, of that initiative. So we're doing that event here on May 16th. Please spread the word to your community groups, to your community board members, to your schools as well, uh, and just um, help us make that a successful event. I know we were joined by a number of other people after I called the roll. If you weren't here for a roll, can you just announce yourself so I can mark you down? I'm one There are others? I thought there were like two others that came in. No? Okay. Did, did I hear correctly? We should expect new appointments in about a week? Uh, that's my understanding, but don't hold me to that. I know that it's being finalized, so uh, don't hold me to that. But um, I know that it's, we are in the midst of. We're desperate for members of my board. We're, we're down, I think, 10. Okay. So we missed a quorum, one meeting, and uh, we have very poor committee attendance right now. Okay. I'll, I'll definitely make sure that I'll, I'll get you an answer in terms of our timeline Thank you. after the meeting. Okay. 
And now we move on to the fun part, our agenda. Um, our first agenda item today is a presentation by Michael Jones from the New York State uh, Liquor Authority on the uh, SLA application. So Mike, uh, come join us. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Michael Jones, and I'm the uh, deputy CEO of the New York State Liquor Authority. And I'm here today to just quickly review and, and give information regarding the, the community boards and, and the, the, their role in the licensing process. Um, because I do get a lot of calls from many community board uh, members, uh, and uh, I thought it would be easier for me more helpful if we had everyone here at one time. Oh, sorry. Okay. There we go. I have my business card, which I'll hand out to uh, everybody uh, once the presentation is over. So feel free to get in touch with me if you have questions, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to answer. So I'll start with what the SLA is, the State Liquor Authority. Our mission is to regulate the sale, manufacture, consumption uh, of alcohol in the state of New York. People may not realize that uh, any time that there is uh, an exchange of alcohol on a commercial premise, generally it requires either a license or a permit. So when I had my daughter's four-year-old birthday party in the local community center and they asked if I was going to have wine for the adults, I needed to get a permit, they were correct that even for a four-year-old birthday party at 10 o'clock in the morning, if I would have wine, uh, I needed a permit. And uh, those are, are one-day permits, they're temporary permits that cost about $38, I think, and they're available to just about anybody. You could have, uh, anyone can ask for a beer or wine uh, permit. Uh, when you have hard liquor, you have to have a full liquor license. So with the number of different types of licenses, but I'll limit it to the, what we call the on-premise license, that's where uh, Alcohol is served on premise, which everyone knows is your bars and your, your restaurants and hotels. And then there's the off premise license, which is mainly the liquor stores and delis and uh, I guess grocery stores that sell uh, alcohol for consumption off premise. <coughs> now, off premise licenses don't require notice to the community board. That's a common question I get. Is They'll see a place that's advertising they're going to be a liquor store, and, and the community board always calls up and says, well, we don't have any notice. They, they're not required to give notice on the off-premise license. However, a community board can send information regarding the liquor store, whether they're in favor or opposed to it. We, you, know, you could always comment on any license application, and, uh, and we do get uh, input on, on many liquor stores. <coughs> Uh, the on-premise license that notifies the community board, um, the, there are uh, rules that apply, um, well actually to the off-premise as well, uh, let me step back for a second. There, there's what is called the 200-foot rule and the 500-foot rule, uh, and they apply to uh, full, uh, hard liquor, full liquor licenses. Now there's another um, I don't want to say mistake, but uh, <clears throat> they, those rules do not apply to beer and wine uh, licenses. The statute states that the, in the very first words of it are the SLA shall issue a license. So generally, we are required to issue licenses to people who apply. I guess we're similar to the DMV with the driver's license. If you qualify, you get it. Uh, that only reason we can turn down an applicant if good cause is shown why uh, they're not entitled to the license. Uh, and uh, the 500 foot case is the, the one where uh, the community board is most involved and that's where the, uh, the it, it changes from the presumption in favor of the applicant to they have to show why it's in the public interest. So let me explain what the 200-foot rule. The 200-foot rule 
is there's no hard liquor sold within 200 feet of a building that's exclusively used as a house of worship or uh, <coughs> excuse me, or a school. Um, it's a term now that, that, that there's a, has been a lot of litigation, so uh, the term exclusively used is, is a time where sometimes the building is taken out of the 200 foot rule. Uh, say there's a building that has a couple apartments upstairs and if they rent apartments out, then it's no longer exclusively used. So the 200 foot rule basically is, is a rule that um, the community board really shouldn't focus on or, or spend too much attention. It's, it's a rule that the SLA has to follow if it is found that this application for a hard liquor license is within 200 feet, we have to uh, deny that license. It's a matter of law. Uh, there's no discretion, unlike the 500 foot case. Yes, you have a question? It was my understanding that a house of worship in a commercial uh, zone or in a commercial strip uh, does not count as a house of worship when it comes to the 200 foot rule. Is that, that is correct? something that I've never Okay. No, I it's, don't believe that's uh, correct. My question then was about schools, because we now have, uh, particularly pre-K, popping up in commercial areas. Yes, uh, so pre-K doesn't count. Uh, pre-K doesn't count. No, uh, daycare and pre-K, uh, the case law goes back, I think it starts at kindergarten. So, and, and there are other scenarios which I don't think are a good idea, but it doesn't apply, like, across the street from an AA place. I, I didn't think that was a good idea, but, and daycare centers. I don't think it's a good idea either, but the statute doesn't. Are there uh, state legislators here? <laughs> no, they don't count. Are there any state legislators here? <laughs> I'm not here to comment on the law. I'm just telling you the way it is now. I can do changes, that. changes in the law, man. I mean, I'm just telling you the way it is now and how we have to apply it. Uh, Understood. But, uh, Mike? Yes. How is that measured? The that's, that's, that's the next part of the tricky. The yeah, so yeah. that's what I tell you. Just. Don't bother with it. You don't want to have to worry about it. Uh, <laughs> 500 foot. <laughs> well, that, that's yeah, still, right. Stick to the 500 foot. All right. The the 200 foot rule. Um, the building has to be on the same street, and if it's on the corner, that's both streets. Uh, it's measured from entrances. <laughs> entrances, main entrances, uh, one that's used by the public. So there are scenarios where there was a door in a school that had no hardware on the outside. So it's an exit. Obviously, you can't go in that door. So that doesn't count. And I think it goes to like the walkway uh, where it meets the sidewalk. And, uh, and what we do, we send an investigator out who actually has a little, and he measures it and does the Pythagorean theorem. <laughs> and uh, he did just recently, within a year, had one that was 199 feet. He said never happened before. But he's like, <laughs> says really it was 199 feet. Uh, there also is case law that once it's over 200 feet, we cannot take that into account, which kind of surprised me. Initially, I thought, hey, 205 feet, 200 is bad, 205 isn't great. I thought we could use it as a discretionary reason, but there's a court of appeals case that says you, we cannot, we cannot deny a license if it's 201 feet. It's, they compared, well, they didn't compare it, I compared it to a 316 uh, foot home run in Yankee Stadium. I mean, it's a home run. Once it's over 200, and we're not allowed to consider it. So, on occasion, I'll get a letter from the community board saying, we want this denied, it's a 200 foot case. And if you're wrong, then we can't deny it. We need, uh, that's why I said as a community board, what you should do is tell us that there's a church nearby it's very helpful for us. We will go out and measure if it's that close. Because on occasion, an applicant won't mention the church, more than on occasion, but if they don't mention it, we may not know about it. We now have, oh, I forgot, the, we have uh, the GIS system. I don't know if you are aware of it on our website. It, that, that's a very helpful tool. I'm glad we got it about two or three years ago. You could put an address, and it will show all the licenses that are issued in that area. And it also has churches and schools and if you print on uh, a report, it will print out all the uh, churches, schools, all of the, for the 500 foot issue, all the hard liquor licenses within 500, I think it goes up to 700 feet actually. And uh, it's, it's really made our job a lot easier. 
Um, I guess I could take questions as I'm doing this. Uh, any other f questions about the 200 foot roll? So basically what I'd like from you is tell us if there is a house of worship or church nearby, but don't spend too much time on it because if it's not the case, well then we can't use it. So if you don't want a liquor license in a certain area, you have to come up with other reasons. Um, so the 500 foot rule is when there are three or more full OP licenses within 500 feet. And that's uh, done as a, let's see, as a crow flies or whatever, 500 in any, any direction. And uh, with our GIS system, it's very helpful and easier for uh, the community board to just figure out if it's a 500 foot case. And as I mentioned earlier in that scenario, the statute requires that the SLA takes the community board's recommendation into account. It's, it's written in there that the, the community board's resolution, uh, however it is discretionary, the SLA can uh, issue a license over community board's objection. However, uh, I, I think it's rare that we would do, uh, get, issue a license over community board's objection. On occasion, I think there's certain issues with limitations, you know, and stipulations we may, you know, the community board says, usually like hours, you know, they want 11, we probably go to 12 or one. I, I don't think I've seen the SLA issue a liquor license till four in the morning on a 500 foot case when the community board was opposed to such things. Uh, which takes me to the next stipulations. These are what most community boards are using these days to allow a liquor license to be issued, but it gives you the opportunity to um, limit certain aspects of what they could do. Mainly it deals with, with hours, uh, limiting the hours. Uh, sometimes the method of operation that you want to see a restaurant, if they say they're a restaurant, you know, they're expected to have a kitchen, they're supposed to have food. Uh, and if you don't want a nightclub, they'll limit, say, no DJs. And uh, if they agree to the stipulations and they become part of the license, uh, we will enforce those stipulations. They become part of the license. And uh, sometimes the licensees don't follow their own agreements, and, uh, but we take them very seriously. Uh, we will, uh, I've seen a number of licenses that were canceled uh, because they said they were a restaurant and they didn't even have a kitchen. And they basically were just a place for people to drink and people understand that if there's no food and you know the later hours they're going to lead to things that cause problems for many of the community members um, mainly I think noise noise is the biggest problem these days uh, similar to sidewalk cafes and uh, rooftops they're always a problem with noise uh, typically community boards would like to limit the number of hours and uh, the number of people that are on these outdoor areas, which uh, if they're part of the stipulations and they agree to them, uh, we do enforce them. Uh, sure. Hi, Anita. We just had a meeting last night. Uh-huh. Yeah, you, uh, we, we now, 
uh, do uh, put some stipulations on the license and ours is something that would be on the license if there was a limitation. Based on the board's recommendation? Uh, well, based on whether the uh, license, uh, whether the recommendation was ad adopted, uh, generally it is. Uh, by the SLA, right. The SLA has the final say on, on whatever the recommendations are. That's right. And, and you, the lawyer rep did bring up a, a good point. What he said is true to a certain extent. The SLA cannot enforce moratoriums. There was a time, um, I think it was Community Board 3 a number of years ago, had these districts where they said, we don't want any more licenses, moratorium. We don't want any license moratorium. And that's what, that was their recommendation to us. So you know, as a community board, you could do whatever you want. You're, you could do that, but we cannot. The SLA cannot enforce that. There's a case law that, you know, that says we have to look at each license individually. So it's not that hard to overcome that. I mean, just don't write in and say this is a moratorium case. This is a place we don't. You say that this is, a, this is the 470th license within 500 feet. This is going to be the 300th bar, sports bar, and we don't see in the public interest. I mean, that, that shows it's not a moratorium, but you're, this specific license doesn't belong there. Now, that, uh, we do have a number of cases like that where we'll get from a community board or one liner saying, you know, more, too many licenses, apply the 500 foot rule. So, uh, we got to say it was out in Queens where the community board just says, you know, apply, apply the 500 foot rule. And I guess they didn't understand it's discretionary. You know, we need a little more. Uh, again, we have to, uh, we're required to take your advice into consideration, but it has to be specific to each license. And uh, what else did they, did they want to stay open later? Oh, on Sundays? Beyond midnight. Right. We'll review the application. We've got to see where it is and see, you know, what his argument, why he has to be open after 12. I mean, yeah. And, uh, Right. See, now that's an example. It's not a moratorium. It's this building is residential. Right. You know, so they have reason. And again, I have to. Oh, and these are, I'm discussing license applications, not renewals. Renewals are separate. But these are new license applications I'm talking about. And the scenario if this is a hard liquor 500 foot case, then. He's probably not going to get his license. Uh, we're not going to. Uh, we're, we're going to have to listen to the community board, I believe. And unless he, could, I said we'd, we'd have to listen to you in a 500 foot case. Only. No, not only. Uh, I, but there is a difference in distinction. A 500 foot case, the statute says we're required to. If it's not a 500 foot, then it's discretionary, and we do take the community board's input. Um, if it was a hard liquor license that's not a 500 foot case, uh, we probably would. If you had what you described to me, uh, residents complaining and things like that, we'd probably take that into account. Actually, yeah. a new application, the residents have, and yet we're just trying to cover the residents by. Yeah, that's going to be a problem. Don't worry. It is a you, no, it's going to be, yeah. Well, it's, it's you, you're doing your job by protecting I the residents. I don't understand what you mean we're going to work with you. Well, are you going to enforce it? We are taking the time to review these applicants. That's number one. Right. And there's a lot of work involved. Because we get like 20 or 25 a month. So, as that is the case, what we want you to do is to make sure that as we represent our community, our community's best interest is first. So, you know, that it sounds a little repetitive. It is. But what we're saying is that as our community continues to see my we want to have some say as to the methodology of operation. And 
Oh. Oh. <coughs> it's it, it's on a license, yes. It is. Yeah. If it's part right, if it, if it's part of the license, if it's adopted and it's part of license, limited hours would be. Uh, What if the applicant doesn't agree to that? that that's, that's what I'm confused about. Community boards can put any stipulation we want to put on there. Right. But if the applicant says, the law says I can sell to four, to right. four in the morning, right. and I don't agree to that, SLA response is, I'm they, assuming you have to go with the applicant if they're not no, within well, 500 feet. No, then, then it goes to the full board, um, which the SLA full board is the chairman and the two commissioners. Um, that's how licenses and disciplinary matters are heard. Uh, we will approve licenses that are not contested, say a, a deli wanting to sell beer. Usually that's not a problem. Someone in our licensing board, someone in our licensing point. will approve that. Restaurants where there's no opposition. There's an individual called licensing, I'm a member of licensing board. I could approve licenses like that. Anytime there's an opposition, those cases will go to the full board, which is the chairman and the two commissioners. They meet twice a month. And in the Harlem it, office. Yeah. And uh, in those cases, the applicant will explain why they have to be open until 4 in the morning. And people have, the, if it's a 500 foot case, there already is a 500 foot hearing, which the community board is notified and they're supposed to show up. or. We so do take out the 500 foot, that is not a 500 foot. Okay, so not a 500 foot, then you, you again, the uh, presumption is in favor of the applicant. Uh, we, however, we will take into consideration all the factors uh, that are in a 500 foot, but uh, it, it's uh, more difficult for us to deny a license. However, we do put, uh, stipulations on, uh, on a number of licenses that are not 500 foot. But Every, everything's it's, fact it's, specific. It's, I mean, it's difficult. Right. Every case is specific, but it, it's difficult for you guys to deny a license based upon if community boards want them, because some community boards have stipulations where they don't, they don't want any places open, until, open, open only up to 2 in the morning. Right. Community boards can say that. But if the applicant says, no, I need to stay open to four, and it's not within the 500-foot rule, it's almost nearly impossible for you guys to deny that, correct? No, no. It's not impossible. It's imp nearly impossible, but we do deny the license itself. But we will we'll put limitations. Matter of fact. But I think it's the enforcement activity that, that is the problem, because we would need, generally need the police department to do it. And they would treat all of the applicants the same, rather than the one that's supposed to close at 2 a.m. Right. And, the the you police know, three blocks down is one that closes at 4 a.m. The police look for criminal and and they necessarily don't have to close. They just have to stop right. selling. They still can stay open to four and sell food. They could be well, they could say that. Gen generally, uh, I took the two o'clock closing as meaning closing at two, unless it's said otherwise, uh, and that's. Because the idea is basically traffic, noise, and people being there after two. So when I see a stipulation that says closing at two, that's closing. Because if they're still eating, hanging out till four, you still have people, you know. And I, I don't know. I, I guess, guess we're in a situation where we're trying to be able to go back to our constituents and explain to them clearly what we can and cannot do as a board when it comes to liquor license applications. And I, I don't know, I'm not getting any clarity right now. It just seems like, you know, is it a case by case basis or is there set specific rules? Because I know the law says they can stay to four in the morning. They can right. sell to four in the morning. So if it's not within 500 feet, I'm trying to figure out what is it that you can use and we can use to justify us telling them to close at two. Because to me, that sounds like a, 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 um, a lawsuit waiting to happen. 
Because then yeah. they're going to come and say, well, these other places are staying open before. Why do I have to close that, too? Exactly. That's what they do. And they sue us, the SLA. They don't, <laughs> right. they don't sue you. Well, not us. I know they're going to sue the, the state, the city. Right. Uh, so, and that's something that we and that's something we spend a lot to of, avoid. So. Oh, yeah. We don't want Article 78s, but we, we do it all the time. And sometimes we win. And uh, the, even though it's not a 500-foot case, there might be a set of facts and circumstances that it'd be in the public interest to, to close it to. Uh, like I said, 500-foot cases, it's much easier. Mm -hmm. You say close it to, we have to listen to you, and usually there's a good reason. The ones that aren't 500 foot or a beer wine, uh, uh, a restaurant wine license, 500 doesn't apply. And frankly, most, I think there's one place now, I've been doing this for five years, but my first four years, there wasn't one beer wine license that was an enforcement issue. Uh, generally, they just not, people like the hard liquor, if they're going to be. Good. You know, I don't think beer and wine. Uh, except for the ones that were selling hard liquor, you know, the beer wine license that was selling hard liquor, well, they weren't supposed to. They right. they were a problem place, and uh, just the community board could do the best to represent. And by, and by the way, these are my constituents. You know, I'm a state agency. I that's why I'm here now. I'm here because I listen to the community the community boards and the residents. So when you say York, it's you know. It, I'm a state agency, and I have to take care of uh, everyone here in Brooklyn as well. And uh, you brought up the common argument with the applicants, especially places that have a number of bars. You have six bars that are open till four, and how am I supposed to compete with those bars? Because you're making me close at two. Well, the answer to that is we probably don't need this, you know, the seventh bar if that's the case. I mean, that's what the 500-foot rule is, is there for. And, uh, Stipulations are, are enforced if they're adopted, uh, and the easiest thing for the applicant is to agree to the stipulations. Now, if they don't agree, then it goes to the full board, and it's pretty much starting from scratch. However, every hearing that I've seen with the chairman and, uh, and the commissioners, they usually start with the community board uh, would like you to close it too, you know what or. Usually we don't, the, the ones that I've seen were, were pretty early, like uh, CB3 in Manhattan wanted someone to close at 11. And uh, I think they made their arguments and uh, I think we let them stay up until 12 or uh, 1. I, I don't, the SLA normally does not go far off from a community board recommendation. Uh, we usually just accept it, you know, and in the 500 foot. Um, more than likely accept it. And the applicant also, it helps them if, if they do come to terms and agreements because if they have a stipulation that's agreed to after the 500 foot hearing, that license can be approved. So the timing is the community board gets notification, then they have to wait 30 days before they can file, which reminds me of another issue. Uh, when you meet with the applicants, we don't have a application before us normally. Um, and then when we get resolutions, sometimes, you know, we'll get something in the mail, but we don't have an application to link it up to. So it's, it's up in Albany in, in a file. So we now are mailing, once we get an application, we mail a letter to the community board that said, we received this application, do you have anything to say? Uh, I'd appreciate it if you were to respond to that even though you sent something three months ago or, you know, say, oh, we already sent something. Just so, uh, and in addition, when people ask for adjournments, I've seen this has been a problem where uh, we've issued a couple licenses because they filed and we had no input from the community board because the applicant said they, they're not ready and they were requesting adjournments, but they didn't tell us that. And the community board didn't mention it to us because they, you were relying on the applicant being truthful, and uh, it doesn't work out sometimes. Uh, so I have some community boards now that are sending emails to me saying, this applicant wants an adjournment. Please do not act on any application before we meet. And that's very helpful. So we have that in our file. Um, after 30 days, if an applicant files on the 31st day and it's a 500-foot case, we send out the 500-foot notice. That's 15 days in advance. 
So now there's, there's 45 days built in to the application process, and the 500 foot hearing is held uh, if the applicant and the community board agree on everything, then we can probably have that license issued soon thereafter. So the applicant really wants to work with the community board. It makes it much easier for them uh, to you know, get a license within two months. Because if there's opposition and they adjourn community board meetings, you meet once a month, uh, if they don't meet the first one, they gotta wait another month, and then finally when they do meet and they get a negative resolution, well, that's not going to help them out either. They go to the 500 foot hearing, and if there's opposition, it's going to go to the full board. My license examiner has to fill out what's called a full board report. They, they do a detailed uh, report, which takes another week or two, and then it goes. So if there's opposition to a, a license, it could take up to six months if it's fast. So um, people don't want to pay rent, they don't want to be, try to operate. Yes. Yeah, this is a, an issue I've had out in Brooklyn where there are places, I guess generally spaces, that have had parties every Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, and they Wednesday. Sometimes Wednesday. Uh, and they've turned into nightclubs, even though they're not licensed. Uh, well, there was one guy that was an expediter or uh, whatever. I guess expedite is what they called him, but he was a criminal, actually. He was using other people's licenses, full liquor licenses, to apply for caterers' permits. That's what you're describing. Uh, we issue caterers' permits to restaurants or someone that has a full liquor license to have a private event to serve hard liquor. People, uh, if you... Exactly. All right. That's exactly what, what it is. So uh, the idea behind it is if something wants to do something that's sort of unique, you know, your off-site wedding, if you want to get married down at the beach or something, or there's a certain loft that you like, you could go to a restaurant or someone who's willing to do it, and what they are doing is using their license off-site, and it, it ha it's a private event that this is done, uh, and they have to cater it. They bring the alcohol, they bring the bartenders, and they bring the food. And that is what a caterer's permit allows you to do. In this circumstance, so first of all, the guy got information from these licenses. They didn't know he was using their license, but he was applying for caterer's permits for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And he was saying, like, a, I don't know, christening from 11 at night till 4 a.m., you know, 250 of his closest friends. and. They were advertising, they were turning it to be a nightclub open to the public. Now, this is about four or five years ago. We caught him and he was convicted for doing all this stuff. But that, that still can be a problem where a caterer's permit, there's no notice to the community board. We, uh, and the one day permits, they notify the local precinct. Now, the community board can tell us if there's a certain uh, place or that, that it continues to have these parties and creates these issues, we will put that location on a uh, denied premise list, that it's called. So we will uh, put your letter in a file anytime someone applies for a, a permit at that, we will deny it. Yes? That's actually the exact point I wanted to bring up. You do inform the precinct of the one day permits. Right. The precinct doesn't always inform us. They probably don't. Is it possible for you to inform us at the same time? Probably not. Uh, we just we have eighty thousand applications licenses. I have one person that does permits. She, you know, Are the you law. You send an email to the precinct with those permits. We we notify Put in one other address. We have to find out what 
community board is there's no requirement. The applicant is required to right. notify the precinct and us. And you know, I mean, I have a staff of one on every application. We'll have to find out what community board is. I mean, applicants themselves mail to the wrong community boards. Uh, I, I mean, I could look into it. Yeah, you can do that. Sure. Well, we will. Um, we could deny the permit if there's, if the event itself is something, you know, if they're going to have 2,000 people in a place, or uh, if there's a history with this uh, license that they have, or the location. Uh, sometimes people throw parties without a permit or a license. And that's another thing that, uh, unlicensed premises, we don't have jurisdiction. So if you find out and call, and I say, well, there's no license or permit issued to this, so that's a police matter. Yeah. And they're required to uh, enforce if they that's want to. Question related to this. Does SLA ever work in concert with other agencies like Department of Buildings, for instance, short of doing a march operation? Generally, the march operation is, is I don't say only, no, that, that's very effective, by the way, the, the PD does that to bring in all agencies that wants to in inspect the problem places. Uh, but we have worked with other agencies, and we also don't have to be there um, when the other agencies have enforcement and they forward it to us, we will uh, prosecute those violations. Uh, the, the, I say the problem, but we require the uh, agency that is primary jurisdiction to enforce the violations. I get a number of letters from the community board saying, well, they don't have a CFO for backyard, basement, or whatever, you know, and then I get the more technical ones where it's a, a C6, and then, but it's not eating and drinking. And my investigators, we don't enforce that. If the buildings department finds a violation and they send it to us, we, we can enforce it then. Um, and all the crimes, you know, about drugs, uh, prostitution, and assaults, those are criminal matters that the police has to send, they have to send us the referrals. Noise generally is a DEP issue, or the police, they enforce noise. And if they issue a summons for noise and send it to us, then we uh, have lawyers that will enforce it. My investigators, uh, generally, uh, we in enforce the stipulation violations that the police would know about. The police can, or actually anyone can, uh, be a witness to a hours violation. If the stipulation says close at two and they're open at three, I've asked precincts, they'll send a uh, uniform officer inside, they'll look around and they'll see that they're still drinking and open and they'll send it over. It's not a crime because the law allows so the fellow left. The law allows you open until four, but it's a violation and, and we will prosecute that. I've had people, individuals, go into the place and they'll send me the receipt. They take a picture. A lot of, with the iPhones these days, you can take pictures. And they say, here I am, 3 a.m. in the morning. And I've had citizens actually testify at our hearings to show that they were, the one that comes to mind was an outdoor area, but they were using the uh, outdoor space after 12. Any other questions, Josephine? Yes, we require that they comply. That's how we get all these other violations in. Is the last line of one of it, it's like a, comply with all rules, regulations of, of the local, local ordinances. So before we issue a license, we require them to file a CFO with us. And they, they're swearing that that CFO allows them to do what they're doing. Now, sometimes they'll give a CFO which doesn't include the backyard, they're using them, and we'll find out later, you know, when buildings goes there or someone, and uh, we, that's a different charge for us, that's a material misrepresentation. 
you know, you're representing that you are ready to open and operate and everything's lawful. And uh, I've seen situations where people submitted a CFO for the building down the road, uh, next door. One last week was just a forgery that uh, it was a whiteout typewriter job, which I haven't seen in 20 years with computers, but it was a... Uh, They, uh, what, what they're doing, most applicants do initially is they'll apply for a license without the outdoor areas just to get all the 500 foot issues out of the way and get their license. And later on, they may apply for the sidewalk or the rooftop. But that's a uh, alteration which the community board gets notification. And uh, then the 500 foot issues come into play. And when they, apply for a license, they give us diagrams, and uh, we license the license premise, which is where the alcohol could be served and also stored. So if you keep your alcohol in the basement, uh, you have to include that in your diagrams and tell us what you're using. it. So if the outdoor areas are not part of the initial license premise, then they can't serve alcohol out there until they get approval from us. And you as well. You said can't serve. People can't drink out there, right? Right. Serve or drink. Consume, right. That's a uh, called an extension of premise violation. And uh, another one we're not too high to happy about. Any other questions? Any last thoughts? Uh, I appreciate your time. I could talk all day about liquor and liquor laws, but uh, my time is limited here. I did want to mention, though, the difference between new applications and renewals. When you get notice about renewals, it's a whole different set of laws and facts, so you can't really confuse the two. We cannot deny a renewal a week before it's up unless, you know, once they have a license, we have to have proven uh, adverse history and charges. and but. I appreciate the letters I get that say that, you know, this place in the past few years has a number of these violations because then I reach out to the PD and those violations and we'll uh, prosecute them for the violations and we could deny or cancel a license any time during the licensing period so it doesn't have to be uh, at the renewal period. So there's nothing unique about the, and by the way, outside of New York City, they don't notify the clerks anymore about five or six years ago. You know, you have the Shimong County clerk getting these renewals for Murphy's Bar for 20 years and like, what do I do with this? So they don't even care about renewals. But down here, we're the only people that still get the notice. And uh, when you send those resolutions regarding place of renewal, uh, it's very helpful for us for our enforcement. I just want to, oh, sorry, go, go, go. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. All right. What happens in the case when um, the business sends in the document to the board late? Because that's been my experience as well. On the renewal, let's say that it's going to expire at the end of this month, which is April, and they send it to us on April 25th, and it, it expires on April 30th. Well, they, uh, they, we will not renew the license until 30 days passes. So they, they should can't sell alcohol until May 25th. And what they'll do is they'll ask for a waiver from the community board, which will, we will take into account and we will not deny the renewal, allow them to operate uh, starting May 1st, but we will fine them for a late renewal. Um, and they still get a penalty because we don't need to review applications the day before because they decided to. Uh, so it's up to the community board. I mean. Some community boards won't issue the waiver, then they can't serve for that, the remainder of the 30 days, so. I just wanted to give you a compliment, though. I haven't heard too many yet. 
Uh, but in the past two years, I think, uh, the enforcement activities have, uh, I think, picked up in my district with the uh, marches with the 72nd Precinct. And I right. do want to compliment you because you did shut down my second most notorious business uh, about three weeks ago. We took the opportunity for um, uh, holding a public hearing simply because they had a corporate change. And we sent documents and, and petitions and, and all sorts of information. And you did shut them down. So we're very happy about it. Well, thank you. Did that guy get it? Any other? The, the camera guy? <laughs> <laughs> right. OK, great. Thank you very much, Mike. Well, I, uh, I'm going to hand out cards to everyone here, and I really would like you to get in touch with me if you have any questions or uh, problem places, especially um, because once I know about it, we could do something. Okay, great. So uh, we're going to move on to our next agenda item. The next three items, you'll notice there's a theme here. Um, for the last year or so, the borough president has made uh, energy efficiency, renewable energy, sustainability um, a big initiative here at Borough Hall. And one of the themes that we're working on for this entire year is the concept of energy literacy to educate people on the availability of different energy efficiency programs, incentive programs, uh, energy conservation programs, things like that. So the next three presentations fit within that theme. And the goal here is to just help disseminate this information because many people do not realize what is available out there in terms of programs they can take advantage of, things they could be tapping into, incentives that, they're, that exist that they're not collecting. Uh, all to live, you know, more sustainable, greener lives, personal, you know, business, et cetera. So with that, we will start with uh, our folks from Con Edison. Come right up. Some uh, what's called demand management at uh, Con Edison. Um, thank you. Normally I'm loud enough, but I guess with the accent as well, it might help to uh, cover it. Um, what I was going to do today is I'm going to hit a little bit of the theme of general education that Andrew spoke about and give you a bit of background on how we actually deliver the power. Um, we have a, a, a new initiative going on in Brooklyn, Queens at the moment, so I'm going to explain that a little bit and uh, give you a bit of a backdrop of some of the, the uh, restructuring that's going on in the energy industry. There's, there's a lot happening in the state at the moment, so I'll give you some, some sort of touch on that. Uh, go through a few of the terms as well, because uh, like every industry, we've got our own jargon, and uh, you know it can be hard to penetrate some of it. Uh, so I want to try and get some of that across the folks who are a little bit comfortable with that as well. But, you know, I've got a few slides here as reference points for conversation, but, you know, please feel free to jump in and, you know, any, any sort of questions. So, how, how do we get the electricity here? Now, some of you may be aware, when it comes to the generation of electricity, Con Edison divested ownership of generation of electricity, so Con Edison doesn't actually generate the electricity. That's a competitive marketplace. Um, so, when you uh, hear of these ESCOs, energy services companies, knocking on your door, they're the folks who are competing to bring you different products in that space. Um, now, what Con Edison's responsibility is to get the energy from wherever it's generated to the point of consumption. And we do that with infrastructure where the generation comes through our transmission system, where you've got higher volumes coming down. And then what happens is it comes into a series of what we call substations. And in those substations, what we're doing is we're moving the electricity, or what we call stepping down the electricity, to a voltage which is what you're going to eventually use in your homes and in your businesses. Now, in um, New York City, it's a little bit different from some other parts of the country. Most of the rest of the country would be familiar with the system where you've got the overhead cables running, what we refer to as a, as a radial system. In uh, New York City, we also have uh, a lot of the underground system, which we refer to as a network system. So, pros and cons on those two things is uh, when you've got the above ground system, it's a little bit more vulnerable to weather events and to things like folks driving into poles. And once you break the pathway of the power, you can't get the power. There's no electricity coming to you. Right? Um, but on the other side, it's fairly inexpensive and easy for us to find when something needs to be fixed. You know, uh, the last gentleman mentioned the, the iPhone, that's great for us as well. You know, folks can take an iPhone, a phone, a cable, it's down, and 
send it to us and you know that we're, we're hoping to be able to use tools with geolocating and all this sort of stuff so you know things are happening there that will have to fix that. On the network system what happens with this is if there's a break in the line here for example there's different pathways at which the power can still get to you so it's very reliable it means that you get you know if we have an issue here not a problem Every, everybody's still getting their power it's terribly expensive, particularly in a very uh, condensed city because any of you who have seen anybody doing any street work and looked at that hole in the ground, you see all this infrastructure, whether it be us or whether it be gas or whether it be water, you know, there's lots of infrastructure under there, so it's very expensive to layer. Um, you have multiple layers of contingency, which means that, that you're sort of building a little bit more than you need as well, which is part of the cost. And then when there is an issue, it tends to be quite widespread and it takes us a little while to fix it because it's much more complex to fix the stuff that's, that's underground, right? So, so pros and cons. Um, now, we have a project going on at the moment where in these areas which are color coded, and I will warn you, when we talk about jargon, it's not just jargon I've discovered. We also um, use names which mean different things to different people. So just to confuse everybody here, now we have these networks that cover very large neighborhood areas. We've got one on Ridgewood, one on Crown Heights, one on Richmond Hill, but they are much larger areas. These are our network areas. These are not the neighborhoods. The neighbors happen to be within those areas. So um, we're, you know, we've learned this little bit about our, our education as we share and I mean, some of the conversations we've had with uh, the Brooklyn Bar of Presidents folks is trying to work out how not to confuse people about how we've got some names embedded in our system that we need to, to try and make translate a little bit better. But we have a project uh, covering these three areas, some it's in Brooklyn, some it's over in Queens. And what is the situation that we're dealing with there is we have a point of constraint coming into a couple of area substations. In, uh, in the neighborhood of Brownsville, we have two substations, and um, whilst we have plenty of infrastructure capacity from the point of view of the substations and from the point of view of the individual electric networks, we've come to a point of constraint in, the, um, in our sub-transmission system is what it's called. So it turns out, funny story that I'm coming straight after the, the, the gentleman with the alcohol, it turns out that all three of these networks um, have been getting very busy with these bars and restaurants, I assume, amongst from everything else. So what that translates to us is, we're getting a lot of demand for energy in the system around 10 and 11 o'clock at night. So, what is happening in here is that it used to be that these three networks, which are all fed from that same, same infrastructure I talked about, they used to do things slightly differently. Things used to happen at slightly different times of the day. Now what's happening is, and, and for us it's all about summer, okay, you can probably guess that. Air conditioning, hot summer nights, I guess, I guess again, hot summer nights, good for the liquor industry, right? Um, but what we're getting is that at 11 o'clock at night during the summer, all three of these networks are really, really busy. There's a huge demand for energy coming in now, later in the evening. And they used to be that they would all sort of reach their peak demand at slightly different times. Now they're all reaching it at the same time. And that means we have this thing called a coincident factor happening. And that's putting a lot of pressure on our infrastructure. And we're trying to work out how to manage against that. So this is our challenge, this is our problem set that, that we're dealing with. Now, um, in the neighborhood that we're, the areas that we're looking at, when we start thinking about how can we be involved in this and how can we impact with that, we, one of the first things we do is we start looking at what is contributing to the, the demand, the need for energy, and we're looking all about coincidence. We're all about who's having an impact. So if I know that it's 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock, that's my real peak time, you know, even if there are education facilities, 
you know, that's probably not what's going to be hitting me at 10, 11 o'clock at night, right? So we have to think a little bit about what are the, what are the, um, the, the, the places where the, this is impacted. Now, 45% of, of the demand for energy in this area is coming from residential consumers, whether they be in um, a single family home or most likely multi-family in a lot of the Brooklyn area, a lot of single family in, in Queens. And then you've got the commercial total as well. Um, so we have to try and, again, work out how we can go and impact the folks who are consuming energy in different ways and how we go about it. And you can see with the account of our accounts, um, you know, while this is the residential goes at 45% of the demand for energy, but by far the highest volume. So obviously you get this economy of scale situation as well, that it's very complex and over lots and lots of different now the other thing, and, and, and you folks will probably be much more aware of this um, than I certainly was when we started investigating this. The other thing we have to be sensitive to is we're, we're looking at opportunities to, to help with energy management in this area, is across our service territory, the um, household incomes below $35,000 a year represent 37% of our, of our customer households. In this target area, it's 46%. I think most of you folks would know that you'd be aware of the fact that it's, there's, there's a lot more of a lower income folks in this area as well. Driving the wrong way. So, simply put, we have infrastructure. So the orange line here is the infrastructure. And this is, this is how much we can carry. This is how much that we can put along all of our equipment in any particular time. And the blue line is the shape that we project for the demand for energy by 2018. And the black line is what we project by 2023. So what we would have traditionally done is we would have gone out and we would have built to bring this line up to here. To simply build more infrastructure, more equipment. And in fact, we were looking at doing a much bigger project, another substation. The substation for us to build is in this area is looking to be about a billion dollars. So it's a very, very big capital project. What we're trying to do here is look at working with customers in order to, instead of building this up to here, can we get this down under here? Um, you know, I think it's a really interesting time in the energy industry because there's lots of things happening that are sort of on the cusp. Uh, people are talking about batteries. And solar, solar, you know, solar's been there for a long time, known, known technology. The challenge is that solar is really good when you're there in the mid middle of the day and in the afternoon, but 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, of course, you're not generating that energy. But as batteries get more efficient and more viable, then you can put the solar power into the battery and then maybe you can, you can get some impact up here. The challenge really is that, that we're at the really early stage of whether that's been economically viable or not. But when we build infrastructure, that infrastructure has a 30 year life. So the trick is to try and get the timing right so that we don't build 30 year infrastructure, if we can avoid it, that would deny the opportunity to use these other solutions that are just becoming economically viable. So we're trying to get that, work that balance out a little bit. And one thing I want to stress here as well is that on the carrying capacity here, um, you know, we're not, not in trouble of supply or anything like that. People aren't going to get, you know, big blackouts or anything like that. There are some things that we can do operationally for short periods of time to get us through uh, these, these overloads. But they're not great. They're detrimental to the equipment. We can run the equipment higher raking, but um, it does reduce the life of the equipment, so it's not something we really want to be doing. It's not the best way to manage our business. So, what are the things that we do? This is where I want to get a bit of the terminology as well that the actor alluded to. So, we're going to do different things on the, the customer side and different things on the utility side. So, on the customer side, you're going to hear talks about energy efficiency. I mean, what is energy efficiency? Um, Energy efficiency is essentially, I want to achieve the same outcome, but I want to do it using less energy. Now that's a pretty broad, broad brush. 
for example, um, you can go and buy a, a window air conditioning unit, you can get an Energy Star unit, um, you can pay a premium for that, you know, you can get, this is great, I'm doing the right thing, I'm getting a good piece of equipment. You bring it into your home, if you don't seal it properly, if your apartment has lots of leaks in it, then you're not going to get the benefit of that maximum efficiency. So you won't be as efficient as you can. So we really like to think about a whole sort of systems approach to energy efficiency. So you can do things like you should be looking at your windows, you should be looking at your doors, make sure you're sealing the environment where you're putting that equipment in. Um, the better you do about that, the more benefit you get out of whatever equipment you buy. Um, beginning of the season, beginning of the summer, clean the filters on your air conditioning. It's, it, it only takes five or 10 minutes, it's probably, you know, I do it not a great thing to do, but it's not that hard, but you will get such a better efficiency out of the equipment that you have. And at the end of the season, clean them again, so that then when you come back next summer, you don't even have to really do that. Things like that, energy efficiency is more than just looking for that energy star label. It's how you, it's how you run and operate it. The analogy I give is, is folks who, who go out and buy a, a car with good energy efficiency, and then they don't change the oil, or they don't pump up the tires, or you know, there are things you can do within that environment that are really easy self-help, but it's an education thing, and this is part of the challenge, I know the brother power presence put on us, is to try and make sure we're providing that type of information as well, and I think you'll see us coming more, more with that. Demand management is a concept that I think you could, you'll probably hear a little bit more as well, this is where batteries come into play. Um, what happens with a battery, is that you don't save energy per se with a battery. What happens with a battery is I can charge my battery here and I can discharge my energy here. So I'm managing the demand for energy. So I'm bringing down this need here and I'm filling up this, this space we have here, but you actually lose energy doing that because what happens is there's some loss when you charge the battery and there's some, some loss when you discharge the, the energy out of that. Um, but it's pretty good, you know, it's a great option, uh, if you want to move solar or something like that. So for us, it becomes really important not just to think about the total energy reduction, but when energy is being consumed as well. So that's why we talk about demand management, and you'll see a little bit of that, that going on with some controls. Um, another good one for demand management is, um, it's a bit cloudy outside today, but you know, you've got this, this building here, it's got beautiful um, windows, right? Lots of light, natural light coming in. Um, there's a balance between trying to keep the heat out, um, but when you've got an option to use natural light coming in, much better than using a light bulb, right? Because your light bulb, no matter how efficient it is, with it, LED is better than CFL, and CFL is better than an incandescent, but they all generate heat. So on a hot day during the summer, what you're actually doing by having a light on and you can use natural light, is you're generating heat, which you then also have to cool against. So you generate an air conditioning billet for your lighting, you know, which is great during the winter. If you're cold in your apartment, put all the incandescents in. It's wonderful, but that's not really what we want to try and achieve from an efficiency point of view. It's not the best way to do it. Um, demand response is quite possibly the term in the energy industry with the highest negatives for marketing. It's the biggest example of utilities not being able to effectively communicate with people. Um, we did some market research on this term. This is an industry-wide <coughs> term. Um, we think about demand as in the demand for energy. It turns out that when we use this term with the public, they think that this monopoly utility is demanding that they respond. So it's a really, you know, an example of a bad use of the English language, right? What it essentially means is that at certain periods of, of time when we're under constraint, we go out to folks who have agreed to work with us and say, would you mind turning some stuff down for a few hours? Or would you mind switching on that battery? Just for three hours or four hours or five hours when we're under peak demand. That would really help us out. We pay people for that. It's actually a revenue generating opportunity for people. A lot of the large commercial buildings make revenue out of working with us on that during the course of the summer. It is an opportunity that is there. We have programs for residential customers where we will give them our programmable thermostats 
um, communicatable devices to control their air conditioning. And what will happen on that is we'll set their thermostat a little bit higher for a short period of time. They can override at any period of time. So if it happens to be a bad time, if it happens to be that you know that they just need to cool down the apartment and want to get the kids to bed, then they can override it. But if it happens to be a day when they're out anyway, then they get this benefit and it helps us as well because it means we can run the system without building this expensive infrastructure. So you, you'll, you'll see product like this, which is being promoted as advertised on our, on our website. Um, solar, I guess everyone's sort of familiar with solar. There's two other terms that, that are used a lot, which I think confuse people a great deal. There's a thing called CHP, which is combined heat and power. That's a pretty big engineering solution, but it, it creates more efficiency from the fact that waste heat that's used for uh, when you're trying to heat water, the waste heat is captured to generate electricity. So you, you get a much more efficiency within the building. So generally you're gonna experience that if you're in a larger commercial building or in a larger multifamily building, you may see that going on. But that's, uh, that's a, and that's also pretty much um, uh, becoming more common, but it's still, it's, it's still quite a complex thing. So I don't think you're gonna see the average folks in the street. Microgrid, lots of folks are talking about microgrids. Um, and pretty much everybody you talk to about microgrid has a different definition of what a microgrid is. Uh, even folks within the energy industry. Um, what a, and mine's true, okay? So whatever I say is the right one. Um, what it essentially is, is that you're creating a sort of sub area where folks are on a, a, a network that can be independent, an electric supply system that can be independent from the rest of the electric grid. Now if you're going to do that, you're going to need a fuel source. So that's something that folks have to think about, there has to be a fuel source there. And there's generally two choices. There's a choice here where you can either be connected in a way where you can still be connected to the electric grid. So there could be decisions that when we need some help, you might switch on your micro grid or you might operate predominantly on your microgrid and then just use us to back you up in case you have any issues or anything like that. Now there are a number of large housing complex in the area who run completely isolated from Con Edison, they run their own infrastructure, they have their own backup. Um, so this, this philosophy already exists, it's out there. Um, very common from where I come from in rural areas, it's just how life is, right? You know, there is no grid, so you, know, you, you tend to have that. Um, but a lot more happened with this, it's, it's uh, particularly out of Sandy, there was a lot of interest in different ways of providing different layers of protection. It's still quite complex, and I has got a number of programs coming through to support this. So I think you're going to hear more of that being talked about, but it gets very confusing very quickly, let me warn you. you go down that um, and energy storage batteries, batteries are, are, as I said, are coming more and more to the fore, so you see more they're quite big at the moment. That's one of the other challenges. They take a very big footprint, and that becomes more of a challenge in New York City. I think you know a lot of battery guys do quite well in California, but a lot of the people they work with tend to have outdoor spaces. They have a lot more space than we do, so we have to try and find innovative ways of where to put them. So that's one of the challenges. Um, we are doing stuff on the utility side that we haven't traditionally done instead of building infrastructure. So we are. We're, we're, Voltage optimization, this is another nebulous energy term. Basically what we're trying to do is we, we're trying to get the voltage as efficiently out there as we possibly can because our challenge is always the last person in the line. The last person in the line is the hardest person to get the perfect energy to because then you've got to work your way back from there. You go and pass everybody else and you want to try and be as efficient coming through them on the way to the last customer. So we've got some new technology now to be able to manage that. Again, we'll be looking at batteries on our side. We'll be exploring all these different ones. Fuel cell is essentially a device which allows uh, natural gas to be turned to electricity. There's been a lot of work with that, a lot of interest in that as well. So next year, more of that. Now, let's talk a little bit about what we're actually doing. Um, you know, if you go to conair.com, and look under energy efficiency, we've got a whole range of programs for residential customers, for uh, small businesses, for multifamily buildings, and for commercial and industrial customers. A um, whole range of stuff there. We're trying to get better about translating this into 
into more understandable sort of product, trying to get rid of some of our, our difficult language. Um, we also have a new program there called the Neighborhood Program, which is the one that targets, targets that mapping area that we have there. One of the things that we've done with that target area is we have a program for small businesses where we pay 70% of their energy efficiency improvement that they put in. Um, and then they would pay the other 30%. Well, a lot of folks, even the 30% is a struggle, right? So what we've done as our first step in order to try and reduce demand for energy in this target area identified is we said to those, that's right, it's gonna be free. We'll pay for everything. Um, and it's funny, even when you give them away free, there's suspicion, right? It's like, well, can I really trust this? Is this reliable? You know, that sort of thing. So I know there's lots of folks out there making all sorts of promises. In this area, approximately 3,000 small businesses have had free stuff installed. Generally lighting, some air conditioning stuff, and maybe lighting. Um, so all of these folks, mark from these dots, are, are getting continuous, ongoing savings on their energy bill and they're helping us avoiding to build heavy infrastructure. So this is already beginning to happen. There are small businesses out there that are benefiting from it. We are looking at doing this for multifamily buildings as well. So we're beginning to roll a, a program out to the multifamily guys in these target areas. Um, and you know, the next challenge for us will be residential. Residential is actually a lot more challenging for us just because of the fact that it's such small units that we're trying to impact in every customer. So to try and get that out there is a bit of a tricky thing for us. But you'll see, you're going to see a lot of this rolling out. And I can tell you that as we talk about the growth and demand here in these parts of Brooklyn to Queens, you know, my, my office is down at 30 Flatbush. I've been there since last summer in there. And I just look around and I go, you know, it's going up, there's all this building work going on. Um, you know, dry goods stores are turning into the, uh, the uh, alfresco dining with, um, you know, whether, whether they're serving alcohol or not. What I do know is that they've got the windows open and the air conditioning blasting out late at night. And that is uh, it's a challenge for us in managing the load. So I think you're going to see us doing a lot more activity uh, across Brooklyn and Queens over the next few years. Um, but we're trying to do it in a way where we're working with the community, where we're bringing solutions uh, to customers so that customers can engage in this. And we know we're going to have to commit a lot more to engage to education. And you'll see us trying to do more of that. Um, I know we've already met with a couple of community boards in this area that are impacted, but certainly we would be uh, you know, grateful for any feedback, any suggestions on uh, how to communicate and uh, what sort of messages we should be putting out there. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Tanya? Uh, yeah. For the uh, multifamily, are you thinking of doing common area uh, uh, measures, or do you actually want? Yeah. I mean, we we end up doing more common area than we do the apartments, just because we can't get through the doors. Yeah. You know, folks are, are very concerned about who's knocking on the door. I mean, you know, there have been incidents recently of people pretending to be Con Ed employees to get in there and take advantage of. Of folks. So what we did with small business, and, and we're looking at doing this in the, the multi-family as well, is that we pre-set them a letter with a picture of the person that was going to come and see them. So we did that with 3,000. When you go to the residential, it's the logistics of getting the right photo of the right person about to turn up at the door is just so challenging. So we're trying to work out how to do that. We are also talking with folks um, that specialize in creating a job creation for the long-term unemployed in the communities, because obviously they will probably have a better relationship at being able to get through some of these doors and to talk to the folks. So we see that as a real, not just as a, to be blunt about it, I see this as a real commercial right thing to do because of the fact they can get through the doors, apart from the benefits to the, to the community of you know, helping those folks get, get some training. Any other questions? No? Cool. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thanks for your time. All right. Next up, we have uh, National Grid. Presentation around the desktop.
subtract it off the side. On the bottom, yeah. Put down. Just roll it down? Yeah, put down this. Hi, everyone. Uh, I want to introduce myself. My name is uh, Luis Rizzo. I'm, uh, I manage the National Grid Energy Fishery Programs for New York City and Long Island. I handle all the multifamily, industrial, and uh, sometimes the residential programs as well, too. I'm just going to cover briefly about the National Grid Programs. I'm going to cover about our energy efficiency programs. Uh, I'm going to try to keep everybody awake because I know it's been a long morning. <laughs> uh, I had a couple, coffee, a couple uh, cups of coffee myself, so I need to stay awake, too. So I'm going to go on. Oh, perfect works. I uh, just want to cover a little bit. Does everyone know who National Grid is? Has everyone heard of us? Is everyone paying their gas bills, which is the most important? Okay, good. Great. Uh, National Grid, we're actually the third largest utility in the United States. We actually have uh, utility services in upstate New York, as well as New York City and Long Island. We actually service three out of the five boroughs. Con Edison provides gas and electric service for the, um, for the remaining boroughs itself. We only provide the gas service for all of Brooklyn, all of Staten Island, and three quarters of Queens, the remaining, and Nassau and Suffolk as well. All the electric services falls underneath uh, Con Edison. In upstate New York area, such as Syracuse, Buffalo, Albany area, we provide gas and electric services in those areas, as well as in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Great. Um, the thing about the energy efficiency programs that we mentioned, energy efficiency programs are, provide quite a bit of value to customers. One of the main reasons of these programs is to help lower our energy bills, as well as for, let's say, commercial customers, is help to increase their bottom line. Because that's the purpose of a lot of these programs, because the lower your energy costs are, the greater the profits that you can have as far as a company-wise. And you see small businesses, residential customers, it, it applies the same way, because the lower your gas bills are, the, lower, the more you have more funding you have to pay, pay or to buy other discretionary products and services. With our energy efficiency programs, I'm going to cover briefly on the commercial programs and multifamily programs, as well as some of the residential programs. Uh, our multifamily programs are comprised, we can only service right now in the New York City area, which is from 5 to 75 unit buildings. So anything within that, that market range, 5 to 75 units, we can provide various types of incentives, which I'm going to be covering. Anything larger than that, or at the current time, we can't provide any incentives on. On the commercial end, where our programs are open to all customers, as long as they, they're on a firm rate. They can't be on what they call an interruptible rate or a TC rate. That's where you burn um, natural gas and oil, depending on what the temperature is, or if there's, depending on whichever is cheaper. So you have to be on a firm rate in order to be eligible. And that's the same thing for multifamily buildings as well, too. And our programs are open to existing customers, oil to gas conversion customers, as well as new construction programs. Our multifamily programs um, are comprised of two parts. One is called prescriptive, which is a straight dollar amount, depending on what you're putting in. And then another one is called custom. Custom is a little bit more, more involved, where we have to look at the project, screen it to see what, how the savings come out to be, and then we send an offer letter. So it's a little bit more involved, but the incentives sometimes can be a little bit more richer, and it can be quite a bit more. On the prescriptive end, does anybody can see this? It just shows just a dollar amount, depending on what you're putting in. So let's say I'm looking to replace my boiler. I have a certain set boiler, so I can get anyway, depending on which one, that they, which one I want to put in. If, if I want to put in, let's say, what they call a condensing type boiler, I can get incentives up to $15,000 per piece of equipment. So let's say if I'm replacing, I have a really big boiler. What's, let's say about 3 million or 4 million BTUs. Uh, what I'm looking to do, instead of putting that one boiler in, because I've been having issues just having one boiler, I want to put multiple boilers, so as, as the need arises, I can turn on multiple boilers. That's something more popular people are doing is, so for each one, in a sense, we can give up to $15,000 per boiler, just for argument's sake. Uh, and the same thing runs. Our, our incentives range anywhere from $200 to $15,000 on the prescriptive end per piece of equipment. We also have incentives on boiler reset controls, uh, as well as indirect water heaters. I have some brochures I'm going to pass out later on. If anyone wants any specific information on any of these programs, we can provide you. Also, if you have any kind of email, I can also send you any information on any literature or anything, any of the programs that we discussed today. We also, one thing that we started on the, on the multifamily program is we're, we're, we're giving incentives on what they call thermostatic radiator valves. This is something that we started this year. What that, help, that does is helps to balance out, balance out the system, especially when you've got apartments that are overheated on the top floors and very cold on the, second, on the bottom floors. 
what that does is it helps to push the steam to other parts of the building to make the building more comfortable so you don't have everyone opening up the apartment, opening up the windows on the top floor because it gets too hot. It's just another way to help to balancing out the systems. With our multifamily program, we also offer a new program, what they call a direct install program. Where we come in, we put in free measures. We're actually doing this in collaboration with Con Edison. We're going into multifamily buildings. We're putting in uh, water saving, gas saving measures. So we're putting in free uh, aerators, shower heads, um, and the aerators are in the bathroom and as well as in the kitchen. The, kit the tenants have actually been really liking those because they're more, uh, it's an upgrade to what they currently have right now. Especially with the shower heads, it's a massage shower head compared to what they currently have. And what that actually does is it actually saves money on water as well as heat. Water saves about 30%, heat saves in the ballpark range of 25%. Which is nice because it can add up quite a bit when you're looking at per apartment. And we're also doing with Con Edison, so when we're going in to replace the water measures, saving measures, Con Edison is putting in free uh, CFLs as well as sometimes LEDs depending on the apartment, and they're putting in um, a smart strip that people can plug in. So you get some, uh, it gets a nice plus for the tenants because they're getting free measures and as well as for the landlord because they're seeing savings on the back end. Any questions on this? Am I talking too quick? We're good? All right, good. Uh, all the buildings can get, as long as, they're on a firm, as long as that building's on a firm rate, every tenant in that building is eligible to get those, those free measures. And anywhere in your service area? Every, anywhere within our service territory, correct. And uh, how is the outreach done to identify those? Or I guess the first question is, how many buildings have you guys covered so far? Um, let's say in Brooklyn or where, other area, all, all three boroughs, and what areas are still you know, targeted for further outreach or development, things like that? So far, we started this program, the direct install program, uh, about a year ago. And today, today we, we've actually completed about 12,000 apartments uh, within the New York City Long Island, within the New York City area itself. And we're looking to, to expand that out further, because I know there's quite a bit more apartments out there that we need to service. Uh, so we're not restricting it. As long as the building's on a firm rate, where we're going in, we're targeting in, and where area is the Barfield, Brownfield area that's, that needs um, assistance with Con Edison. We're working collaboratively with those, helping those customers, as well as looking at other areas that, were, that are in need. So anywhere that um, we're going, first we're going neighborhood by neighborhood, we're segmenting it, and then we're expanding out a little further. We've done quite a bit in the, the Brooklyn, um, the Bushwick area itself. We're, we're looking to do quite a bit now in Staten Island uh, and do some pocket, pockets in, in um, Queens as well too. Question? New construction, a lot of the water saving measures, it's already manda uh, it's mandatory by code. So we can't do anything new because it's, by code they have to put in low flow fixtures and um, within their building. So any kind of apartments, new construction, we can't. However, if they're doing any kind of heating equipment, we can provide them incentives on new, new construction heating equipment that they can provide, as well as any kind of controls. But as far as the free measures, because it's code, we can't provide any incentives on those. When I was talking about the custom incentive programs, the custom incentive programs can be pretty rich. We generally pay up to 50% of the project cost with a cap of $250,000. And that can include uh, a mixture of anywhere from a uh, heat recovery system to uh, energy management systems, which are becoming very popular in the market. We've been giving quite a bit of incentives on those um, to burners, absorption chillers, and so forth. These are big type ticket items. And what we generally do is we screen them to see what the savings would be, and we give incentives on those. Um, and we've been doing very well with our custom program. The customers have been seeing some quite a bit nice uh, incentives on those. Um, and just to cover some additional incentives that we have, we have pipe insulation and what they call steam traps too as well. We can give incentives on per, per, per replacement steam traps for the multifamily. On the commercial end, it's pretty much a boilerplate of what the multifamily is. We have a straight dollar amount depending on what they're, they're installing. The only difference is on the commercial end, we can offer incentives on integrated water heater boilers. Those are combination type boilers. We can give incentives on those. Uh, we offer the same similar type of thing, indirect water heaters, thermostats, and boilers on the commercial end, as well as the steam traps. One of the things that's underneath our commercial program is we can offer incentives on kitchen equipment. 
We've done quite a bit of incentives that we're giving right now on different types of Energy Star rated kitchen equipment. And we've been targeting a lot of the restaurants and local community areas and we're giving incentives on those. So actually that's been helping out quite a bit because we've been working with anywhere from nursing homes to healthcare facilities. They're putting in our Energy Star type of kitchen equipment. We've actually we even worked with the Board of Education as well too. Uh, in the schools, they're starting to replace a lot of the kitchen equipment that they have. We put more Energy Star rated equipment and we've been helping them with incentives on doing more schools. So we can give incentives. One of the things too that we're doing on the on the commercial end too is we can go for incentives on what they call pre-rent spray valves. So if it's a new restaurant that's putting in that we're looking to put in a pre-rent spray valve or replace it, we can do, there's two options for them. They can get a rebate on that up to $75, uh, up to 70% of the cost of the spray valve. Or we can give underneath the commercial direct install program, we can actually put that in for free too. So on the commercial program we started this year, we're also offering a direct install program that's uh, the customers that we can come into businesses, replace their kitchen and bathroom aerators, and put in, uh, even in some gym gymnasiums and some nursing care facilities, we're putting in free shower heads and low flow spray valves for free. This is something new that we started this year and we've been targeting areas in Brooklyn. Uh, we're targeting some Queens and we're gonna be hitting, I guess within a week or two in, um, in Staten Island as well too. So this is a new program we started and we actually, we've had some really good success with it and we're trying to get more traction on that too as well. Any questions on this? On the commercial end, one of the things that we offer too is we offer incentives on steam trap surveys. That's when a large facility is looking to reduce their steam usage and they, they have a lot of traps. They don't know if they're actually good or bad. We can give incentives. Let's say if they do a study on it, we can pay up to $5,000 of the study to, f towards that. So they can do when they, they do a steam trap study, we can give incentives as well as when they replace the steam traps, we can give incentives on per steam trap replacement too. So we've done quite a bit of projects. We're doing something with the, um, the Brooklyn Museum they've done, and we have quite a bit of other projects that we've worked with. On the custom, and it's pretty much the same thing I was indicating before, we can pay up to 50% of the project cost with a cap of $250,000 for commercial, proje commercial projects. Uh, I, just, uh, I just wanna have a couple case studies just to show you what the savings would be and what, what incentives are, just to give you more real life examples. We have two examples that we recently that I put in here. One is Arrow Linen, which is a local linen supply company here in Brooklyn. What they recently did is they replaced their boilers. They also replaced their steam traps and as well as their dryer. They put more Energy Star rated type of boiler and as well as Energy Star rated dryer that they initially put in. Um, the total project cost for this was around $200,000. Our incentives, after we calculated, came out roughly around $92,000. We calculated the annual savings that this company was gonna have annually it was roughly in the ballpark range of 95,000 therms. What that means is right now a therm is about a, a dollar, let's say, to make my math simple, about a dollar per therm. It's about $95,000 the customer is gonna save every year when they, because they did this project. Actually, the actual payback for this project was about a year and a half, a little bit more. But it was very close. It was very short payback for this customer. And this customer did quite a bit of projects. So it's, even whether it's a large customer I have another customer that just recently replaced, let's say, Borough Park Center. They replaced their kitchen. They did a new kitchen, nursing home facilities. They replaced their kitchen. Uh, it was a small project cost, around $12,000. They got about $4,000 from incentives from us for kitchen equipment. They actually save about 1,000 therms, 1,100 therms annually. And the payback for this was less than two years. So I just wanted to give you these two examples to show you regardless if it's a larger customer that's looking to do a little bit more or even more than that, or a smaller customer, there's savings to be had as far as incentives that we can offer and money that they're gonna save at the end. And this, these are some of the things that we have. These are just two case studies, but we have dozens of other types of customers that have actually saved and done very well with our programs. Any questions on this? Um, I just wanna to touch just very briefly on our residential programs, because there's a lot of residential customers. So if there's a residential building, that has a multifamily building that has each, in the, each apartment has its own heating unit. Um, that would fall underneath our residential programs and we can give incentives on. So for example, let's say a co-op and condo that may have, instead of having one centralized boiler for the whole building, now it, each apartment has its own heating system. They would be eligible for incentives underneath our residential program, meaning that we can give incentives on per piece of heating equipment replaced. 
So if a customer's looking, let's say, to replace their heating unit, whether it's a furnace or a boiler, we can give incentives on those. We can range anywhere from $200 to $1,000. And we've done quite a few. And this, this, is, um, this applies to new construction as well, too. So if they're doing a lot of new construction buildings in the area and they're looking to put a heating unit per apartment, we can give incentives on those. And I've worked with quite a large developers and builders, and we've given quite a bit of incentives to these uh, contractors that put in these new higher efficiency units as well as when they're putting in, let's say, uh, tankless water heaters, we're giving incentives on that. Indirect water heaters, condensing water heaters, energy star. These are new products that we recently introduced this year to give incentives on to really help motivate the market. Uh, one of the other things that we have now within this year, we added thermostatic radiator valves for residential customers. Uh, it's because in the New York market, it's roughly about 80% saturated with steam systems. Um, so the thermostatic radiator valves quite a bit helps, especially with the two-family, three-family houses that the tenant's always on the third floor, always complaining about being too cold. This helps to balance out the systems, and it does work very well. And we're also giving incentives on insulation-type products, pipe insulation as well as the tank wraps. Um, and as a thank you, customers that participate in our residential program get a little thank you gift where we're sending them a free spray valve, uh, I'm sorry, free shower head and aerator as a thank you for participating in our programs. So we're just trying different things for customers to participate and as well as to see the additional value by, by putting in higher efficiency products. I included here a bunch of numbers. Uh, the numbers here to get information about our equipment program. Our website indicated nationalgrid.com slash energy efficiency services will give you a list of all the energy efficiency programs that I talked about today. I'll also have a little literature on the table and I'll have some additional literature on any of the other programs that you may have or want information on. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, any questions? So I have a question for both you guys and for National Grid and Condad. What, what are the obstacles that you see, the biggest obstacles in terms of outreach efforts to, to get these programs, the incentive programs on both sides more widely adopted? It, it's been difficult because I've been running these energy efficiency programs for about eight years now. Uh, and it's always been a challenge for awareness because you can, have, you can give away all the money in the world, uh, but people not willing to take it, believe it, believe it or not. And it's, it's gets, it gets difficult because the challenge is always having the awareness out there on what's available out there and also having the, the trades adapt to putting in the products that make sense. Um, that's also been, we've gotten over that hurdle as far as having the trades do it, but it's, it's always been a challenge as far as helping to increase the awareness of what's out there and what's available out there for the customers. On the custom end too, we, we do, we've been doing quite a bit of that too, because then we get large custom projects that we can, we look at it to see if it makes sense, we can give any values, or if they're doing um, larger than all scope that we can provide, we generally turn them over to not NYSERDA. So both, we can both offer those type of services if need be. Um, generally the programs that have always been a challenge as far as prescriptively, we've actually made quite a bit of a changes with our programs over the years as far as now having an online option that people can submit all applications via online and submit upload documents. So we're trying different options because there's different, there's different ways of handling customers, whether it's a residential customer or a large commercial customer. Um, and we're trying, trying different strategies and challenges to help overcome a lot of the barriers that were currently out there. 
that's a good segue to our final presentation that I started. I'm going to come back with some more questions later on, but I guess we'll invite uh, Solar One that I started to come up and round us out on this conversation. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for staying. You made it. Um, just a little bit more about energy efficiency and renewables. Um, my name is Rachel Eve Stein, and I'm the program manager for uh, the NYSERDA EDGE program. Um, I work for Solar One. I'll explain a little bit about that in a second. Um, where is this the clicker here? Okay. What was it? Okay, uh, so this is just a brief agenda. We'll get through all these things in just a second. Um, just a brief introduction to NYSERDA, so that stands for New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Um, NYSERDA is a state, quasi-state agency. Uh, the goals are to reduce energy consumption, promote renewable energy sources, create a clean energy economy, and protect the environment. You'll notice here, um, we're currently, our, uh, our programs are funded by uh, rate payers through the system's benefits charge. That is going to change next year. Um, the New York State Public Service Commission put out something called the REV, Reforming Energy Vision. Are people familiar with this at all? Okay, um, basically it's just changing the way that we interact with utilities as customers. Um, and I'm not gonna go into the whole thing right now. It would, take up the whole rest of the meeting. Um, but basically, you'll see these initiatives, these new um, initiatives through NYSERDA um, that are sort of um, jump-starting the whole, the whole program. And NYSERDA uh, will fund these programs through the Clean Energy Fund, or CEF. So that is going to replace the system's benefits charge. So just keep that in the back of your head. Um, all right, so NYSERDA EDGE. EDGE stands for Economic Development Growth Extension. Basically, all you need to know is that we um, are kind of NYSERDA's outreach arm. We're here to help you navigate all of NYSERDA's energy efficiency and renewables uh, programs. Um, I represent the downstate region, which is New York City, Long Island, Westchester, but this is a statewide program, so I'm happy to connect people with whoever they needed to, need to be connected to. Um, so as you can see, we educate business owners, community leaders, homeowners, and the public through events. Um, we are on the Brooklyn Borough President's Reset Committee. We are all over the place just kind of really getting ourselves into, into the community. And before we get to Pratt Center and I introduce Simon, um, just a brief note. So I work for Solar One. We're the contractor to NYSERDA. And uh, Solar One is a clean energy education uh, nonprofit. And we have a K through 12 education program. So you might have heard us because we are working with students in public schools in your communities. Uh, we also have a workforce training lab out in Long Island City. We manage a park. Um, Stuyvesant Cove Park in Manhattan. There's a great event space over there as well. Um, and the other thing is we have a uh, community solar program. You're probably hearing a lot about community solar now called Here Comes Solar. So it's just another one of these initiatives. And I just got to bring it up because um, they have several projects going on in the Brooklyn area. Um, currently right now, I know there's one, sorry, this is cheesy. I'm looking at my phone right now. Um, there is a, there are two homeowner groups so far, five homes in Park Slope Gowanus area, seven homes in Prospect Lefferts Gardens. There's a lot more planned uh, for the South Brooklyn area and Central Brooklyn. You can get at me afterwards and I can um, give you a little bit more detail on that. Basically by homeowners coming together and uh, kind of working with the contractors, they can get the best deal on solar and they've saved about 20% um, on costs. So that's great. Um, and now I'm going to introduce to you Simon Mugo, who uh, is our Brooklyn Regional Outreach Contractor. He works out of our subcontractor, 
Pratt Center, and he is all things Brooklyn, and here he is. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, just to give you a brief uh, idea of who I am and uh, the organization that I represent, uh, my name is Simon Mugo. I am the NYSERDA Edge, uh, Bro uh, the Brooklyn NYSERDA Edge Regional Outreach Contractor. Uh, it's a long title, but what that means is that I help you to match your project and your community members and provide them access to uh, all the NYSERDA programs. And I just want to say a quick thank you for everyone who's managed to stay through the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, I've done, a, actually, two years ago, I did a presentation at a community board meeting, and I was, you know, at, at the start of the event, the event was re really packed. Uh, and at the end of the event, when I finally got a chance to speak, there was maybe three people in the crowd. So I thank you so much for that. Uh, so the Pratt Center, we are a nonprofit. We're housed within the Pratt Institute. Uh, our, we work in four main issue areas. So I work within the energy efficiency focus. Uh, we also do a lot of sustainable community planning, transportation equity planning. And we also have an urban, manu urban manufacturing uh, focus that we have an initiative called Made in NYC that promotes local manufacturers. So anyone who manufactures a product uh, within the five boroughs can join our list and we help them with sourcing issues and we help them with marketing. Um, some of the manufacturers are not tech savvy, so we help. We have interns that come in through the, the Pratt Institute, but we help them set up a social media presence which is something that's very critical in this day and age for any business to operate and communicate with their customers. Uh, so how can we help? Uh, we help clients identify all available programs and financing, as I mentioned. Uh, we also support, support clients through the application process. Uh, and the other main thing that we do is that we try to engage with the community and support partners at events. So we try to get as many events that we can, we can go out to to communicate that you know, NYSERDA has energy efficiency programs and renewable programs, and these programs are here to help. So if you have any project in mind, or if you're just thinking about uh, a boiler replacement for your home, or you have a new building that's coming up in your community, there are programs that can help them, um, you know, mit mitigate those costs. Uh, the New York Sun Initiative, something that uh, is very exciting. Uh, it's been, it was launched uh, in 2012. And since the program was launched, uh, they installed more solar within the first year of that program than the previous decade uh, since in, before the, the, the program existed. So in a nutshell, it's uh, the governor's initiative. They have about a billion dollars in funding to support solar PV in New York State. Um, and they have uh, different ways where they use that funding. So the first is a PV trainers network to educate uh, lower, uh, you know, local officials, public officials, to help them understand what solar actually is as a technology and how uh, they can streamline their process to support more solar installations within their communities. Uh, so I'd be very interested to work with Andrew and all of you to see if there's any interest to have uh, intro to solar course to educate you on, you know, what actually goes into planning a solar project, everything from the solar design, uh, to the requirements from DOB and everything else. So at least then you can have more, more of a substantive uh, idea of what a solar project entails and how you can support it in your community. Uh, and as part of that, uh, we, NYSERDA also has a community solar program that is a part of the New York Sun Initiative that provides funding for local community groups um, and community boards would serve as a local community group uh, we provide up to $5,000 in, in funding to help you organize a community solar initiative. And I think Community Board 6, I'm not sure if uh, you're still here, I know Community Board 6 has a, a community solar program. Um, and so if you're interested in setting up a similar program for your community board, uh, I'd be very interested to help you uh, identify what funding and support NYSERDA can provide to you. Uh, so community is all I already mentioned. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, but we also support the K through solar program that provides uh, technical assistance to uh, public schools that are thinking about putting solar on their buildings. And this is uh, mainly funded by NYPA, but it's in conjunction with NYSERDA. Uh, CHP, as uh, folks from Con Ed mentioned before, uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the technology. Uh, but essentially, it's just an, uh, it, it's two types of e either uh, a reciprocating engine or micro turbine. Um, and essentially, it's an engine that generates electricity, and the byproduct is heat. So you can use that heat for space heating with your building or uh, to preheat your water. 
Uh, and the benefit of that is that you can still run when there's a grid outage. So during Hurricane Sandy, buildings that had CHP installed were still, be, were still able to operate their buildings, not fully operational, but some of the critical loads were still being served, whether it's a common air lighting or what have you. Um, but you know, in this day and age, I think CHP is something that, that is widely available, and uh, we're trying to make this accessible to everyone. Uh, so we're having a, a number of CHP tours where, you know, if you're not familiar with the technology, you want to see it firsthand and see what it looks like and how it operates. Uh, we have been having a bunch of tours in Brooklyn and all over the, uh, the other boroughs. Uh, the most recent one was at the Torin building where we had uh, 35 to 45 people walking around the building and they actually had the chance to see what the system looks like and talk to the building owners to see what uh, what, how the experience has been since they installed the system. Uh, so this is just a picture of what a CHP system looks like. It's, uh, this is a uh, 75 kilowatt system. Um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, but as I mentioned, it's similar to a car engine where it generates, uh, you know, the electricity as well as uh, heat as a byproduct. So this is just a quick snapshot of the types of programs that NYSERDA has, and you'll notice a lot of similarities between Con Ed, National Grid, and NYSERDA programming. So I'm not going to spend too much time um, focusing on the details of the program. Uh, I think the key takeaway for today is that, you know, NYSERDA does have programs, and these are the sectors that they focus on. And if you need any further assistance, I'm here to help you. So the FlexSec program does a, uh, energy analysis for large buildings. Uh, we have a, SME, a free small commercial energy assessment for smaller businesses. Uh, and that just gives them uh, an education on how their building is operating. And we give them a list of recommendations of what they can do to improve their energy efficiency and reduce their energy costs. Uh, we have programs for new construction. Uh, we also have programs for existing facilities. And these are both for commercial buildings. But we do have um, new construction and existing facilities for um, uh, residential buildings, which is just a multifamily performance program. Uh, we have different paths that you can go through, whether it's a small project where you're just replacing your boiler, you can go through the pre-qualified path, or if you're doing a larger project where you're doing a, uh, you know, a more extensive uh, energy efficiency project, whether it's putting in solar, lighting and a host of other measures, then you would be better uh, served by the performance-based program. And there's just a quick snapshot of the application process. You put in the application, we help you with that. You need some supporting document, and I sort of reviews it, and the funding was provided, and you can begin your project. Uh, residential, just to take a quick second to review uh, these programs. The multifamily performance program is for buildings with five units or above. We don't have an upper limit, um, but at the moment, the program is only serving electric home, buildings. Home Performance with Energy Star, a uh, quick note on that. This program is set to expire at the end of this year. Uh, the program, the biggest benefit is that, one, it provides you with a free energy assessment. So if you have uh, community members who own a, a, a home uh, between one and four units, they can get a free assessment. Um, and they can also have uh, re receive a discount. Uh, the Empower program provides free assessments and free um, actual direct installation measures. Uh, the only caveat with that is you have to there the residents or tenants within that unit have to be six below 60 percent of the area median income. So if you can qualify for heat funding, you can qualify for other uh, assistance then you would qualify for this program and we can come in and install you know, free refrigerators and, uh, as well as lighting and other small measures. Uh, it's just a snapshot of the application process. Um, you know, I, I would say c contact me if you have any issues, uh, but most of the information is on the NYSERDA website. Uh, other programs that NYSERDA has, a uh, quick snapshot, we just have the New York, New York Truck Voucher Incentive Program. Uh, where we help manufacturers and industrial users to purchase electric, uh, electric trucks or convert their trucks, their trucks to uh, compressed natural gas. So if you have any manufacturer or industrial users within your districts and they're interested in purchasing a new fleet, uh, then this, this program would definitely be a good fit for them. So how NYSERDA EDGE can help. Uh, we bridge informational gaps. We support local communities. 
engagement throughout the region so there's consistency across the entire state and we actually do a lot of proactive ma marketing where we do tours educational events and the like yeah and that's it and that's my contact information feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions any uh, you need any further information on any of these programs I'll be more than happy to help you thank you hey I just wanted to add a quick thing um, that we actually do have a, a, a CHP tour coming up next week at Fairway Red Hook. Um, so that's gonna be April 22nd in the morning. Um, and we'll be following up with everybody too. I know Simon gave out his cards, but we really wanna work individually with all of you because some of these programs, uh, like Simon mentioned, they're gonna run out. We want to have your residents, to have Brooklyn residents get that money while it's still there, and then take, in it, uh, take advantage of these new NYSERDA initiatives so that you guys can really be at the forefront of all of this. Um, yeah, and then there's a CHP Expo happening also in Brooklyn, May 5th at the Brooklyn Marriott, I believe? Yes. Um, so we'll also send out more information on that. Any, uh, any questions? I know this is a lot of information to throw at you guys today, um, and this is, and you can see there's a, there's a huge you know, education gap in terms of what's, what, what is and what people know and what's out there and how we can get people to take advantage of this. So I guess kind of the soft ask of the day, and this all folds into the Borough President's Reset Agenda Initiative, which is the Renewable and uh, Sustainable Energy Task Force, is if there's opportunities in your districts to do education pieces, whether you want to get your commercial, um, you know, your bids together or your merchant associations together or you want to have uh, presentations at your meetings or whatever it is, if there's a way that we can fold in some of these education campaigns at the community board level or even just at the community level, I think that, that would go a long way to getting that information out there. I know our office is, is committing to getting more information out there. We're going to do a series of educational events. We're going to have information provided online and things like that. But really, the more people that can hear about these things and know that there's basically money on the table that they can take advantage of, the better it is. And I think coming from community boards, coming from the borough president's office, other elected officials' offices, it lends a, um, a lot of legitimacy to, uh, to these programs. And that would be very, very helpful. And it's greener and better living as well. So uh, just think about that. It's not a hard ask, it's a soft ask, but just keep it in the back of your minds as you're thinking about your agendas for the year. We love to find ways to kind of promote that educational piece with the community boards. Any other thoughts or, to or comments on this topic? Sure, just positive. Well, for those of you that stayed, I think we have free solar panels for everyone. So you're all <laughs> just kidding. Okay, uh, are there, uh, is there any old?